Chris Fisher is here. He may know more about sharks than anybody alive. In 2007, he founded OSEARCH. It is dedicated to obtaining a more comprehensive knowledge about the ocean's most feared predator. OSEARCH has tracked more than 100 sharks. The vast majority have been great whites. The organization takes a novel approach to catching and biosampling on board without using a harpoon. Over 40 sharks are currently being tracked around the world in real time on OSEARCH website. I am pleased to have Chris Fisher at this table. Welcome. Thank Good you, Charlie. You it is a privilege to be here. Thank you. We have been doing conversations uh, um, at CBS, and I'm honored to have you here. Tell me in your own words about this thing between you and sharks. I think this thing is really between me and the ocean and the sharks are the way I can affect change soonest, and it's one of the biggest crises on the water. And so we have massive knowledge gaps of all these giant creatures. And if we don't solve the puzzle of their lives, we can't ensure their future. And without their future, there is no future for the ocean. Ecosystem in the ocean is, is determinate by what the sharks do. Yeah, they are the great balance keeper, the lion of the ocean. They are the top of the food chain. If they get removed from the system, the rest of the system collapses, falls out of balance, and right now, 200,000 sharks today were finned and removed from the oceans, up to 73 million by a who? year. By commercial fishermen around the world, finning them to send those fins to Asia for a bowl of soup. We are trading the future of the ocean for a bowl of soup. When you look at them, just tell me about them, the majesty of the great whites, also the fear that they, in, induce in people. It isn't one of the most humbling things you can experience standing next to a live great white shark. You're, you really feel like you're standing next to a living dinosaur. And the impact that has on, on people is amazing. You, you'll see 60-year-old scientists, the most mature scientists on the planet, guys like Bob Huter from Moat Laboratory. They've been studying these animals for 40 years. They've never touched a live one. Mm -hmm. So they can solve it. And you see a grown man come to tears and you're standing next to an animal that is evolutionary perfection, that is um, the king of the sea. What are his qualities? How big is he? What does he weigh? 18 What's feet long. What's the difference in he and she, the whole thing? She's always fatter than he is. Yeah. She's 16 and a half feet long, and she's 16 feet around, over 4,000 pounds, so she can carry 10 four and a half foot babies. He is... Four and a half foot babies. Yeah, they give birth to whole babies, up 10 to 14 of them, four and a half feet long. They drop them off on a beach somewhere in a quiet place where there's plenty of food. Yeah. He is far more aggressive. He is 18 feet long, not as fat as she is, but far more determined. Yeah. And... Um, to, to begin to solve their puzzle. He wanders to and from the breeding site every year. She goes on a two-year migratory route because it takes her 18 months to have her babies. So what kind of migratory route does, she, route does she go on? She will go on a trip leaving the breeding site, yeah. cover about 1,000 miles a month, month after month after month, until she ends up in a place where she likes to gestate. Yeah. In the Pacific, we call that the sofa. It's that area halfway between L.A. and Hawaii. We're trying to determine where that is in the Atlantic. If I had to guess right now, I'd say our shark Mary Lee has showed us where she's going to settle in and gestate. And where is that? Which is offshore of the southeastern United States. Right off of Florida. Right, right. off that Florida-Georgia border. Yeah. And, and what is it about that place, you think, that makes that a site? There's something there where there's a dependable food source where she can stay for a long period of time and succeed and let her babies grow. Does temperature of water make a difference? Yeah, I think it's probably right. It's a little bit warmer, right? Less stress on her body, mm -hmm. easier to push the energy of the babies. These are all guesses that yeah. the scientist and I, we talk about based on what we've learned around the world. And soon we will have the data we need. And, and you're trying to get this data for what reason? Well, we have to know where the nursery is so that we can get any sort of destructive gear types out of the nursery. We can't be gill netting the great white shark nursery. That's when they're most vulnerable. They're small. It's very difficult to kill a large mature white shark. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to kill a small baby white shark. So we have to know where the nurseries are. We also have to discover the breeding sites. We must give those mature animals a little bit of room so they can succeed. We must have our balance keepers. They got to have a robust future. Imagine Africa with no lions. And with this information, you hope to what? Convince national governments that they have to 
stopped? Oh, absolutely. I spend a lot of time with policymakers. I have to get myself in a position to be with them so we can affect the future of the ocean. And it's not necessarily to stop, it's to create a sustainable path. I mean, one of the things I'm focused on is always maintaining a centrist, data-driven approach. Otherwise, I'm just an activist with an agenda, Yeah. right? If you're an explorer, pioneering research, you have to just go where the data takes you. And so we need to let that data take us to a place where we can create a, a future for our sharks. So tell me what you do. Oh, what do I do? Um, I didn't really know this about myself. I was at a kind of a think tank meeting this last weekend. I didn't realize how disruptive I am. We have come in and disrupted exploration. Rather than institutions deciding who explorers are, we found an entrepreneurial way to get it done, which allows us to not serve the institution, but serve the resource. We've disrupted, disrupted the approach to research. Instead of individuals and institutions trying to get ahead, we get them all to collaborate and put the sharks in the ocean first. Mm. Uh, we've disrupted television to some degree. We leveraged television for four years, series television, mm. to build a global brand and fund $10 million worth of research over and four years. How many have you tagged so far? We've tagged about 100 sharks of various species, about 65 great whites. And how do you do that? We have to capture the fish. And this was part of the method in the beginning that we had to pioneer that was very difficult, you know, because no one had ever captured these 4,000 pound great white sharks before. I remember the fear heading out of, of, of not knowing what's gonna happen. I'm getting emotional. I, I remember, I can't believe I'm at this table. And I remember in 2007 heading out with my captain, Captain Brett McBride, who's been with me on the water since the, the 90s, and looking at him and the fear of, of bringing a group of people together with a scientist and creating bridges across these communities and not knowing what is going to happen. And we went out there and we got kicked in the face a few times, but we never gave up. Kicked in the face means? Means like they would destroy our gear. They were breaking our bodies. We couldn't, you know, the biggest gear in the world was being destroyed. But, you know, my, like I used to sit at a dinner table very much like this at, at my parents' house. And my father and mother, they were amazing. They always used to say, you know, um, never get overwhelmed by a scale of a challenge. An inch is a cinch. A yard is very hard. Just keep <laughs> inching forward. And something that seems impossible soon will be right there before you. So how and we you... inched forward and we figured it out. So how will you measure success? We will measure success by published papers we can leverage for policy. We have over 40 published papers being written on our work right now. We will measure success on how inclusive we are, open source all of our data, o bring the people in the world onto the ship by giving the content away, give the data away, allow the world to track the sharks. And what's really exciting is I think really, as an explorer, we will be there with anyone. At the end of 2015, I will have led my 25th expedition. Cousteau led 27, I'll be 46 years old. But Right now, we are getting ready you to... You think of your mission as like Cousteau? I think uh, my mission is to pour the world's oceans into people's homes and devices so they can have a relationship so they care about its future. Mm -hmm. And pour it into children's homes. We're getting ready to launch a, a STEM-based educational curriculum that's integrated mm -hmm. in to the shark tracker. We captivated the kids by tracking the sharks, mm -hmm. and now we're going to make science cool again. They're going to learn their math, their geography, and geology while they're tracking the great white shark. And so what stands in the way of your of reaching all these goals? I think many of the things that have stood in the way we have already passed through. Now it's about continuing. So you're two-thirds home, say? I'd say we're, you know, we've proved the method. We've proved the pedigree. We're funded. Some of our great Fortune 500 companies have stepped up and said, hey, this is great for the planet. This is great for our brand. This is great for our children. Oh, and we're going to educate your future employees so they have great skill sets for you, STEM-based skills, which is the future mm -hmm. of our jobs. So now it's about, you know, keeping everyone alive, Charlie. It's about leading 22 people on a trip that I go to from here with everything in order and now just solely living in the moment to get all the sharks and all the people through it so that at the end, you know, we can just, I think, explode our scale in inclusion and get the whole world exploring. What kid doesn't want to be an explorer? What kid isn't an explorer? We are trying to make it so they can be on our ship with us at all times and explore with us. There's been some perce some, some uh, perceptions of sharks in the media. One mm -hmm. of the movie, what was it called, Shark NATO or something yeah. like that? Mm -hmm. That's about a great white who sort of puts fear in Los Angeles, that kind of thing. Yeah. Does that do harm to your goal or is that simply looked on as entertainment and everybody knows the difference? 
I think that it's mostly the latter. I mean, it's so ridiculous and so out there. I really think that what Sharknado is, is just leveraging the charisma of sharks right. for a clever multi -con multi platform content distribution mm -hmm. strategy. They got people tweeting while they're watching and they're driving traffic, and it's a successful content distribution strategy. I don't really think it has much to do with sharks. And then you had Shark Week on the Discovery Channel. Mm -hmm. Now, what was that? Shark Week is really different than we are. You know, we are replacing all of the unknown that creates the fear around movies yeah, and sharks right, with right. facts, you know, so that we can then begin to be curious about their lives. Um, when you look at... You, you, actually, what you want to do, and I know this from conversation, is change the perception. So if you appreciate <sighs> the shark, understand the danger, but appreciate the shark and, and how it is central to the ecosystem of the ocean... You know, then you will see them in a different way. That's correct. And if that kind of idea gains scale, then you may be able to make some inroads in terms of protecting the young sharks. Absolutely. I mean, when I talk to the scientists, if we can shift the tone around the conversation of sharks from the theme music to Jaws to one of curiosity, then that could be as important as anything we learn. And the excitement for you even today to be on the water, you know, and seeing a great white is what? Simple things like I love to see the scientists when we deliver them something they've studied their whole life and never touched. I love the fact that we are exploding the body of knowledge forward and covering them up in data. And I love the fact that we can be now 100% on mission and open source everything and, and just be inclusive. I believe inclusiveness is inspiring. Hmm. Exclusiveness is a turnoff. And so if we can be exclusive, inclusive at every level, we can inspire the world. I want to ask you about two specifics. One, the Global Shark Tracker. Mm -hmm. You developed that. Mm -hmm. That is simply being able to... That is to... being inclusive. Yeah. That is allowing the world to see our data real time as the sharks travel beside the PhDs so that people can be a part of seeing where the shark's going. And that is what's creating the conversation with the curious tone because people are chatting online. What are they doing? Why is Mary Lee off the Southeast? Is she giving birth? Yeah. You know, instead of like, ah, there's a shark. You know, it's a totally different conversation. Tell them who Mary Lee is. Mary Lee is a 4,000-pound uh, great white shark tagged off Cape Cod that is named after my mother. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, I thought it was going to be the last shark we ever tagged. I had, uh, our show had been canceled from the network it was on. I had scraped together the last of my family's personal liquid cash, and I funded the Cape Cod expedition last September because I was like, this is it. We, if we don't go do this now, um, it, it may never happen, and I probably can only hold on for a few months and, before I get buried by the ship. And because we weren't making a show for the first time, I was able to invite the global media to participate on the ship. Be inclusive. And suddenly, the media distributed the story about our work and our impressions, the people who followed, was six times greater than the amount of people who had watched our TV series that year on television. And suddenly I was like, we're bigger when we are inclusive. We're bigger when we invite the world in to explore than we are by uh, making series television, which didn't allow us to do that because it would scoop the series that would air eight months later. Now, Mary Lee... Mary Lee saved my business, saved my house. She, uh, I mean, this shark also stays close to the coast. Yeah, we did not know that was going to happen. She ignited this conversation. She ignited the southeastern United States. She was cruising around. Here you have a 16 and a half foot shark spending a tremendous a amount of its time in 15 feet of water. Wow. Right in the surf. And it, it ignited the southeastern United States. And I'm so proud of that area of the world because those people, you know, you're from that North part Carolina, of the world. Right? Yes, yes. I'm sorry about the University of Louisville's <laughs> success last year in the NCAA. We'll get over it. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, the leadership of the southeastern United States, those people are so connected to the ocean down there. You know, they live on the ocean, they love the ocean, that they began the conversation about Mary Lee, and it was one of curiosity. I really think they inspired the rest of the country and planet. How long will you do this? I will do this until the job is done. And if that takes the rest of my days and I can hold it together, I will do that. I mean, I am on a mission. I, it is not hard to get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> and uh, there is much that needs to be done. And if not us, then who? There is no one I'd be helping them. 
Thank you for coming. Yeah. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.